Okay, um, first is a lot at Lake Chateau Woods Thank you. for 18,000, Zarina Lawson. Wait, I'm not getting it to go. Let me take a second or two. Okay. Oh, it's going now. Okay. Uh, 15 9 15 Kings Cypress Lane in Cypress Ridge 1999. Jonathan Williamson, you're out in my neck of the woods. Yeah, all the way out in the darkness. <laughs> um, yeah, this is a cute little house. It's got a lot of upgrades for that, for that builder. Um, I put it on Friday. I've already got an offer. I think oh we should be able to work it out. Awesome. Good. Wow. Would you like 10 more of those? Yeah, I would yeah. like 10 more. <laughs> no kidding. I, I might be a cypher agent now. I don't know. <laughs> okay, 3310 Harbrook in Ashford Cove in Silver Lake in Paraland. 250 Turk. Seventy-seven thirty Magnolia two sixty-nine nine Jonathan. Oh yeah, that, this one's cool because it's uh it's over in the Mason Park area of East End, which is a little deeper in, but it's a great area. Um, obviously a colorful living room. We're gonna take care of that and paint it white. Uh, <laughs> but it's, very it's, it's fully remodeled. Why is the um, Christmas tree? Um... Yeah, it was. <laughs> Those were taken last month. I probably need to get new photos. And yeah. the tents are there. It's yeah. challenging. Um, so it, it's the cool thing about it is it's, it's like a, it's over an eleven thousand square foot lot inside the loop for under three hundred thousand, and it's a fully remodeled house with new electrical, new plumbing, new HVAC, and all that as of say two thousand. I think early two thousand eighteen, something like that. Did <laughs> the remodel? It's a neat house. When you paint your one wall, garage, too, when you paint your thinking. walls white, you can take new pictures of that yeah. and the lack of Christmas tree. I don't think they're going to make the tenants leave until they sell it. So I don't know if I'm going to get new photos, uh, but I sure would like to. You need to get rid like of new Christmas photos tree without though, the trucks in the really front yard too. Try, yeah. Uh, yeah. Try. Try. Yeah. Okay, two hundred one Avondale three ten Julie O'Neill. <laughs> really love I love that. 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 Wow. No. 1401 Calumet, 315, Don Gervais. That's Il Palazzo? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Wow. Mm -hmm. As this building finally got all their yeah. stucco issues worked out. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it's it's a nice much. building. It's a cool building. Uh -huh. And it's a great yeah. location. Yeah. This is not it, this does not look quite most of the places there. It's very white. Look at that house. Balcony. Wow. Yeah. They that's what they're known for. Yeah, they got great awesome outdoor balcony. space. Wow. How big, how big is that? I'm sorry. Uh, it is 1247. <laughs> one bedroom, one bath. <clears throat> 1201 Ford Nova and Briar Lake, 379.9 Beverly Jordan. 
Uh, this house is a four bedroom, two and a half bath, been completely wall stocked down, half bath added, uh, really nicely done. Um, all the concrete has the sidewalks to the front door to the garage, underground um, um, the, um, pipes. Uh, well, the vent of uh, the gutters are underground out to the street, which is fabulous for a remodel job like this. This is the energy corridor actually building. Price good too. That's, that's an old picture. Ten zero zero seven Park Trail, three ninety nine Ruthie Porterfield, Park at Saddlebrook. Yeah, yeah, there it is. Is ninety three fifty square feet. But you know what? That's a good price for a lot. Mm -hmm. You could build a big house. Well, you could. It depends on where. Dollars. Where is it? Would you yeah. mind hitting the thing to see where it is in there? No, the, the little the address. address. No. Well, it's a little square that the map. The map. The oh, well, the address is the same thing. Picture. Oh, here. there you go. Yeah. If you just hit on the address, it goes the same thing. Uh, it looks like it does not back to a uh, 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 That should be a good one. <coughs> Uh, uh, boy, that's good. The street's on the other side, right? Wow. Yeah, it's the Timber Terrace is right yeah. there. That house on Timber Terrace on the corner of the market. Hey, 9214 East Bronco and Western Oaks, 429 Jennifer Lucio. <laughs> <clears throat> 5001 Blossom, 429 Kelly Austin. Sixteen twenty one Alamo and Sawyer Park, four thirty four nine on Krantz. <clears throat> Sixteen oh six Water Oak Point, four thirty five a Sally Kamichik. Seventy three twenty seven Rustling Oaks in Bridalwood Estates, four seventy seven Paul Silverman. What you know? Four seventy seven.
Twenty-one twenty-one Bering um, in, in the Lexington five ten Eric Heine. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, artificial term. <coughs> Twenty one oh seven Woodhead. Indiana Grove, 599-999, Jessica Davis. Eighteen oh four Hudley in Shepherd Crest, six fifty. Jane Holdy. Sorry. Holdy. Holdy, sorry. Yes. Name Good Street. Oh, look at that. Look at somebody's oh, name. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pretty. Interesting. <coughs> Pretty good. Nice. I usually get those garden yeah. guys up there. Is that, yeah. is that three bedrooms? Thank you. It is three bedrooms. Yeah, three bedrooms. Yeah. <coughs> nice. Wow. 3132 University, 925. Karen. Okay, y'all, this is a relist. This is the best value in West University. It was literally taken to the studs by Ronna Milbauer uh, oh. in 2013, and it's just beautiful. It's got, um, that's virtually staged. That's the same room, virtually staged two different ways as a study and as a living room. A whole, all the hardwoods on the first floor were replaced. It's also virtually staged. The whole kitchen was bedded, all the cabinets, the flooring, the lighting, the cheap rock, everything. Professional grade appliances. It's a three bedroom, three full bath. That's the full bath on the first floor. It's a powder bath, but it's a full bath. Laundry room. The master is virtually staged, master bath. Wow, um, the staging looks good. Yeah, it's all, that's virtual staging. And then, um, they had spacemen come in after they bought it and did the closet. They uh, changed the air conditioning out, added up the new front door, changed the landscape. Lots and lots of things changed a lot of the windows. There's a little studio. This room to the right is north of the garage. So it's not included in the square footage, but it has a full bath in it. And so it's a little small room. It's just a little extra little bonus room. Uh, they took out the decking and put brick pavers in. It's on a... Uh, 50 by 125 lot, so a larger than typical lot for West University. It is on the corner of University and Buffalo Speedway. There is, you know, a light right in front of the house, so it's very easy to get in and out of the driveway. Where do you enter on Buffalo? <coughs> yeah. You get to the driveway is on Buffalo, yeah. Front of the house is on University. Any potential for I mean, it would have to be. 1942 house. Yeah, it's built in 1942. I know what it was built. No, I mean, no. I mean, it would have to be retrofitted. It's not two closets or anything. You know, Karen, that price. That price. You should get. Well, we put it on the. It comped out at a million too. Yeah. We put it on the market at a million, and it just hadn't gotten the activity. Reduced it to nine fifty, and we just reduced it and relisted it at nine twenty five. She paid nine twenty for it. Wow. And then she's put, you know, a lot of money into it. It is what it is, and here's where we are. <laughs> so there you go. 
Yeah, no, it's not going to go for 800. No, it's not. No. And she said it was in the high end. Said, yeah, so there's the no way. Yeah, thank you. 4901 Bellevue, 939 <coughs> Jake Cecil. It's a relist. Um, house is built by the Hunter Group. It's on. It's in a prime, prime location. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's on the corner of um, Bellevue and uh, Second Street. Great area for kids. The house is being gently updated. All bedrooms up. So it was All nine. Up. Oh, it's the same price. Yeah. Um, they painted the outside of so. Is it in Bel Air proper? It's, yeah. It's, oh, yeah. That would be considered the hog of Bel Air. My brother used to live on the streets, Great Street. It's a Great Street. Horseshoe Shape Street. By the Rex Center. 5301 Pocahontas and 1,049 James Cecil. Also a realist. Yeah. And this is one I can convert to the stage seven. This is one Fifty-three seventeen line passes in Lamar Terrace, a million one, Ruthie Porterfield. Thirty-seven sixty-one Drummond and Grace Heights, a million two sixty-eight Stormy Hayes. Twenty-two thirty-one Tangley in Southampton, a million four seventy-five Jay Monroe. This is the same price it was before. <laughs> you have. Forty seventy Drummond, a million nine fifty, Margaret Vincent. <coughs> wow. three this is that three line. Line. Yeah, three yeah. three Look at that. But I think there's a house on two of them. There's a house on two of them. A nice ranch. I said that to our ranch. Can you build a shop? I don't think so. <laughs> Wow. I think there's three houses. Yeah, three houses. One nine nine. 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 No, no, no. <laughs> 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 
is 40,162 square feet. 316 Bunker Hill, 2,145,000. Karen. Okay, this is also a ring list. This came on originally at 2,500,000. So this is, and they took it off and did kind of a decor reboot, getting rid of all the jewel tones and the swag draperies and all of that type of deal. It is on a magnificent lot with the beautiful, I call it the secret gardens. It's just beautiful. It has a master down and a uh, two-story study, you know, with like the library loft upstairs. It is very neutral now, as you can see. You know, all that was red and the cloud ceilings and all that kind of deal. And all that's been removed. And the bold colors, the blue paint and this and that has all come out. Beautiful hardwood floors, big living room, big dining room. Wonderful kitchen, breakfast, family room. Appliances are all 2018. So, I mean, I, I feel like they've done the heavy lifting, if you will. Somebody, you know, wants to still come in. They moved all the red rugs out and all that kind of stuff. So, it, sh it, it really good. shows yeah. beautifully. It will nice. be open this Thursday, 12 to 2, and it will be open Sunday. This bedroom has a little loft, which is kind of fun up there. Yeah. <laughs> a little, yeah. Which is, you get there in a little thing in the bathroom. And that room, they did not change. That's the, that's the game room, media room, which is kind of like a pub. It's got a big wet bar in it, which is very, very nice. And it also has an exercise room or a separate game room. And then it's got a giant side yard. So if somebody wants a pool, there's a giant side yard. You definitely could have a wedding in this backyard. I mean, it is magnificent back there. And he's got a super green thumb and... It really, it, the grounds are gorgeous. It's, really it's, wow, it's in a little cul de sac with just three houses. Showings on it since you've done all this, since you put it back on? Very few. Yeah. Uh, we did have a showing on uh, uh, Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. 2431 Nottingham, 2,605,000. Two million six hundred five. David Atkins. 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 I think so. Very unique house. Eleven West Lane, four million two, Ruthie Porterfield. Eleven eight forty nine Wink Road. Lakeview, Patty Garrison for four million six fifty. Yeah. 
This is not anywhere near the water, is it? No. I mean, it's a bike ride or a walk. What's the address on this? On Wink. It's, no, it's corner a corner one. of Wink and Nip. It's not a tender so one. It's in like in several blocks. <coughs> yeah, it's can probably half your, a mile. Can your children use it? No. no. Not so without a sandalwood. Uh, yes. I mean, regular. Okay. The, the, the like few people have to be guests of the sandalwood. Oh, okay. Whoa. This house is gigantic, too. It's yeah. huge. I mean, it's nice, but it's, it's a very... Well, I think it's like 10,000. Yeah, that you should move those photos up because those are like amazing. Yeah. Pizza. Pizza. That's beautiful. How do you move those up? They're watching. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay. <laughs> excuse me, excuse me, Victoria, will you hit the lights for me, please? Any other new listings? Yes, sir. Headley. Okay, so <laughs> I've got a couple of new listings coming up. Um, first one coming up is that house that I've spoken a little bit about. It's finally ready to go. They have literally been working for four months on fixing a exterior wall not attached to the house. Oh my gosh. So it's being painted this week, 5409 Valerie. It's on an acre in Bel Air. Um, house was custom built. It's built to Miami-Dade County hurricane standards. Comes with an underground 10,000 gallon rain harvesting system. Um, and a aquarium tank that uh, can show what fish react when it's thundering above. Um, <laughs> great house, off the top. They I have. I want to go over there when it runs. <laughs> we can make it. Under. I can make it rain at any <laughs> second. What are you going to have? You push a button. Um, um, I'm going to do a big open house, and it's going to probably be in the next two weeks. They have over six million dollars in the house. Oh, We're putting it on the market at four point seven. Oh wow! Um, it's it really is. Then another one that I've got coming up. This one is behind the JCC. Uh, Fifty six fifty Dumfries was built about four years ago. It's raised, never flooded, and it's a single uh, story home. Um, really nice size lot. The house was custom built by um, Case and Gray. Um, it is absolutely beautiful, and that's probably that's coming on the market at nine seventy five. Um, I've got a realist coming on. I sold it a few years ago on Spruce in Bel Air, Master Down, Contemporary, um, amazing wine cellar, uh, pool, um, and that's coming on at a million three. I've got another one coming on in, on Grand Lake in the 5500 block. This house is about six years old, was a uh, David Weekly home. Um, highly, highly, highly upgraded. Backyard is like a secret garden. Um, with a hot tub in, and we're putting that on the market at a million two seventy five. Um, and then I've got another one coming on at five oh nine Palmetto, um, just east of Rice in Bel Air. Um, it, this one will need a little bit of work. The unique thing on this house is it's got a pool. Um, main the house is mainly first floor living. There is one bedroom and a bathroom upstairs. That's it. The rest of the house is all downstairs. And that's coming on the market somewhere around just under a million dollars. Did, did it flood? Did not flood. And I've got another one coming on on Avenue B. What have you been doing? <laughs> not selling real estate, but listing real estate. Listing, you got a list to exist, though. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Avenue B. And actually, I'm going to share a story with you. Can I? Uh huh. Okay, so this one is really a weird story. So we got contractually, I'm sitting on contractually, and I'm working it. and. You know, one, you know how it prompts you to contact an old past client, so I do that, and I get a phone call a few minutes later, and the client was a lawyer, and he calls me up and he says, Headley, you're not going to believe how perfectly timed your email was. I'm sitting with the client in my office, he needs to sell his house, and I, I was trying to figure out who I would refer him to, and oh. your email came across. Perfect. Wow. There so, you go. But wait, it gets, weird, it gets weirder. So I go to the list listing appointment. The house was a house that I never listed, but I worked with the builder on designing and it was a Bel Air showcase house, Mediterranean with the pool, with the master down, and we're putting that on at a million four seventy five. Wow. So use contractually. Okay. 
Contextually. Contextually. Yeah. Use that too. I meant to phrase it all. Context to take this contract. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Any other new listings? Haley has listed everything in the city, but does anybody else have anything else? That's not the list. Leash, you. Fine. In the last picture I saw you, you were standing in the snow surrounded by some beautiful women. Was that your family? My girlfriend and my daughters. <laughs> well, let me tell you, they looked good. Yeah. <laughs> Happy New Year, everybody. How are you doing? Good. My name is Leash. I'm an insurance agent. I schlep insurance, whether it's homeowners, <laughs> auto, life, whatever. Um, if you guys need an insurance agent, I would love to be that guy. <laughs> Um, it's amazing. This this room holds a lot of people. It doesn't feel like anybody's here, right? There's there's like fifty of you here though. Uh, I always like to try to count. And it's, there's people watching. There's people watching. 35, 35, 35, 35, 35 people watching. 35 people watching. Oh, that's kind of nerve wracking. Right? <laughs> you need so, a little powder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do. I, I just need to put a bag over my face. I no, no, no. Um, real quick, government is still shut down, but it doesn't yeah. impact the FEMA flood program. There was some back and forth on whether it was going to impact it, um, but it, they decided they're going to keep it open, allow us to close our deals if we need them closed, and renew our deals if we need to renew them. I have no idea what's going to happen if we actually have claims um, because it, they are kind of light staffed right now, but we can close our deals, so FEMA flood pro program, no big deal. Okay. So uh, other things, um, there's a lot of new faces here, a lot of, a lot of legacy faces here as well. So, so just real quick, I um, wanted to just give you just five real quick pointers as far as insurance is concerned uh, in, in the real estate world. Number one, if you don't have an insurance agent that you like and trust, please find one and install that person on your team. If you have one, give me a shot, please. I'd love to still be on your referral team. Number two, use the heck out of your insurance person. Your insurance person should be able to run claims reports for you on your listings and on your prospective buys. They can do a lot of things for you. If your insurance agent doesn't do that, I, I know somebody that can. Number three, whatever you do, make sure if you have an imminent closing, close the insurance policy prior to the option period. There's all kinds of stuff that can happen um, during the insurance buying process that come up and may not allow them to close as easy as you thought they would. Or insurance, homeowner's insurance is not created equal. No insurance is created equal. Don't look at the bottom line and so this is the cheapest crap I can find. This is what I'm going to buy, right? Luxury insurance is much better coverage than normal insurance. And most of you guys probably can place your business in luxury carriers. It's typically cheaper and better coverage. Last thing, tip number five. Flood insurance, always recommend flood insurance, okay? Um, any questions for me on the insurance box seat? Uh, Leash, what would you recommend for agents as the best website to go to to look at whether a home is in the 100 year flood plain? Great question. What is the best website for, I'm re repeating the question for everybody. So what's the best? Thank you. Yeah. You read our home. You read our home. Yes. Did you see that? What is the best website <laughs> For flood zone determinations, you can for always for, for agents. You can always email me because then I'll give it to you kind of definitively. But there is a great Google overlay. It's if you open up Google Maps and then you open up this Google overlay and it overlays FEMA's flood program and their maps onto the Google Maps. And it's called StayDry.KMZ. If you if you Google StayDry.KMZ, you'll you sh it, and it's kind of hard to navigate. K, yeah, K is in, uh, yeah, kangaroo. M is in Mary. Z is in zebra. What does that stand It's a it's a type of file that FEMA has created, and I don't really know what this, the, the extension file stands for. But yeah, but it's it's difficult to navigate to. But if you email me, I will send you the file, and all you have to do is double click on it because it, it, there's there's several statewide.kmzs out there. Email me and I'll send it to you. And all you do is you double click on it, you enter the address, and it pops up. And then, and then you can tell exactly where it is compared to the 500 year flood zone, the 100 year flood zone, or just the zone X. It's beautiful. But bottom line on that also, if um, the lender is has the final determination, if it's if your house is just right on the border, you always want to check with the lender because their determination may be different than state address determination. Okay. But yes, sir. What's your email address? It is leash, spelled like a dog leash, L-E-A-S-H, at agency, like an insurance agency, and my last name, yu.com. So leash at agency, yu.com. Great question. I texted you, is that okay? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, 
I'm asking to pass. I'd like you to be my insurance agent, but you said if I have USAA, that that's the better coverage I can get, or best coverage I can get. So, mm -hmm. so, that that more. so the question is, is USA the best coverage you can get? The answer is no. So USA, USA is a great insurance company, but there's a better coverage um, in the million dollar plus market where USA starts to fall off. Mm -hmm. So if your house is, uh, it's reconstruction cost is a million and above, you can say, we saved you kind of like $9,000 last year from USA to we put them on here. And the same thing's true for any of those direct writing companies like State Farm or Farmers. You guys need to really listen to what he's saying. If you have somebody that's moving up in the world and now all of a sudden, after 10 years, he's had a $500,000 house, now he's going to have a million dollar house. I've saved, when I used to sell insurance, I've saved people thousands of dollars by going from State Farm to Chubb. Yeah. Because the, those agencies like USAA and State Farm don't want to be in the luxury market. Yeah. That's there, not what they do. There's lots of opportunity if your house is a million dollars and above. Your house below. But if you're not in the million dollar market, yeah. like yeah. yeah. If you're not well, in the million dollar not. market, the USA is just fine. Oh, you're just but fine. still, one more thing, one more thing. When you call USAA, you get 1-800-whoever-picks-up-the-phone. Yeah. When you call Lee Shu, you get Lee Shu, yeah. who Hopefully. represents for the Hopefully companies. you get me. Unless he's on the slope. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 I didn't post that. My daughter posted that. Uh -huh. She should not tag me on that. Chubb is also insuring That's why you have to do it. Yeah. yeah. So don't think of that as the yeah, so a lot of the luxury carriers have dropped down to five hundred thousand, seven fifty. Their their rates aren't as competitive, but you get you get really good service and really good coverage. So good trade off. Hey, thank you guys for all the referrals. Again, I need ten more years of referrals. You are doing here. At least you is truly a sore. You don't want to forget this guy. We love him, and so uh, it's why you. Yes. Google me. Google him. That's right. Thank, thank you guys thank so much. Thank you. Okay, here we go. CT, you ready? I told CT I'm so excited she's doing this because, you know, well, we need to know because these homeowners associations are just nuts. You know, boy, a little power goes to their head. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Watch out. Perfect. Yes. They're is uh, often a lot of excitement surrounding homeowners associations and condo owners associations. And uh, recently we've experienced some excitement. Uh, so uh, I thought this might be a good time to really talk about these. Now, um, uh, if y'all in the back, if you don't have the handout, we have some handouts in the chairs further up. And if you're further up, then maybe if you can hand some back. There are a lot of people in the back who might not have this. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. All right, so let's just dive right in. We're going to talk about a few uh, real world scenarios. Um, and then we're going to kind of learn some lessons and talk about those uh, that, that the real world scenarios will make very evident and clear. So um, so we had a condo listed for sale. Uh, it went under contract. Um, per, the, uh, per the contract, the condo contract, and, and, and let's remember what's a main difference between condos and condo owner associations versus homeowner associations. If you're selling a condo, you are always going to have a condo owners association, right? And that's why with condos, as you'll see here on the handout, the, the, the flip side of the first page is the first page of the condo owners, I'm sorry, of the condo uh, contract. Right. And so the, the basically the, Owners addend the condo owners addendum, which is separate if you're selling a home or a townhome, is built into the condominium contract. So you don't need a separate homeowners addendum for a condo contract. It's built in because they always have the association. If you're selling a house or a townhome, will it always have a mandatory homeowners association? No. No, it might not. So that's why with our one to four family residential contract, 
the association requirements are not built into the contract. You have to use a separate addendum, which is on page one. So a lot of people have questions about that and don't quite understand why that is that way. So anyway, if we look at our at, at our condominium document, you see there's a number of days here on, um, it's under 2B2, talks about the condo documents, and then C talks about the resale certificate, the condo resale certificate. So <clears throat> the seller has a certain number of days that is written in there. I'll often see 10, sometimes I'll see seven, sometimes I'll see 14. If you are the listing agent, it's a good idea to find out from the management company or the owner's association, how long will it take for me to get these documents and the resale certificate? Because if they say, well, we need a minimum of 10 days and, and, and your seller accepts a contract that says you're gonna deliver them in five, well then you've you know, just walked into a problem that you could have avoided. So, it's a good idea to find out how many days they need. See, two, their days are weekdays. They don't work and, weekends and holidays. And their days may, may so be business they say, days also. They usually say two weeks, and they need 14 yeah. days. Yes. Yes. What River Oaks is running right now on resale certificates. Can you Does anyone pass? know how long it takes you can get with River Oaks? You can get a premium. Okay. Okay, so yeah. in River Oaks, you can get them quickly if you pay. Like most things in the world. 10, all right, so moving right along here. Um, all right, so going back to our scenario. So, uh, per the condo contract, the seller had 10 days to deliver the condo documents to the buyer. Well, the seller and the listing agent started trying to get the, the condo docs, and they found out that the person in charge of delivering them was out of town, was unavailable, and it was, there was going to be a delay. They wouldn't be able to get them within the 10 days. So the listing agent contacted the buyer's agent and said, well, we have a little problem. We're not going to be able to get them within the 10 days. The buyer's agent said, you know, that's fine. I know you're working on it. Don't worry about it. All right, so that was the communication. So, uh, so, so, so that was good that the, the, the listing agent and the seller, you know, realized that and, and did let them know. Now they could have maybe done an amendment, but is that really necessary? Let's keep, let's keep on uh, with the story and we'll figure that out. So, um, so the condo association docs were eventually delivered on the 17th day after the effective date. So they were delivered, but it was just a little bit late. And then um, closing was scheduled to occur a couple weeks later, and uh, the buyer had a new resident orientation with the building management that's required for all new residents. And during that orientation, the buyer learned that, um, that per the condominium bylaws, every new owner is required to install fire sprinklers uh, in the unit if they have not already been installed. So when there's a transfer, the new buyer is responsible for putting in the sprinklers. Uh, the cost of this was $12,000. So, um, all right, so uh, of course, uh, the buyer and the buyer's agent demanded to the seller and the seller's agent, you need to pay this $12,000. And here's, here's, Here's what they said. The seller had a duty to disclose the fact that uh, that there that the sprinkler system had to be upgraded. Well, was that a defect that had to be put on the seller's disclosure notice? It's not a defect. Uh, and also, what we said was, uh, you know, the buyers this obligation to to install the sprinkler system was in the bylaws. The condo docs were delivered to you, and if we, let's just, I know this is a little weird, but if we go back, the contract says, the condominium contract says, buyer may cancel the contract before the sixth day after buyer receives the documents. Now, that is not changed by the fact that the documents were delivered late. So, um, if the documents had been delivered on the 10th day, the buyer would have had six days to terminate the contract. If they were delivered Late. on the you know, 25th day, the buyer would have still had six days to cancel the contract. Yes, Jack? That's basically like the objection uh, on the 1 to 4. 
Uh, it's not like, it's, he asked if it was like the objection on the one to four family contract. It really isn't because it's just a right to cancel the contract. It doesn't talk about any seller's right to come in and try to cure objections. Um, and that is, if y'all look at that condo contract, that first page, uh, it says it on uh, paragraph 2B. Um, it says that buyer may cancel the contract before the sixth day after buyer receives the documents. Uh, also, under for the resale certificate under C, it says that buyer may cancel a contract before the sixth day after the date buyer receives the resale certificate. So did he cancel? So did he try to cancel the flight? No. Oh, no. Weeks no. So weeks so later. in this case, uh, weeks later he attended. The in weeks. this case, the buyer received the documents. The buyer had that right to terminate after receiving them, and didn't. Why? Guess why? No one read them. Who reads those? Uh, well, I just, uh, we'll talk about it. Um, <laughs> but in the docs, it did say that that was a requirement. Yes, of the it place. did say it very clearly so, uh, in the documents. So, you know, a lot of agents <coughs> and buyers don't bother to read these documents. We should. <laughs> they don't. There can be some important stuff in there. Okay, so let's go back to where we were. So, you know, we said, hey, we gave you the docs. It was in there. You, you even had the right to terminate after you received them. You didn't. So then they said, well, you didn't give us the docs within the 10 days required. Well, that's true, but buyer, you still had that right to terminate. So the fact that the docs are delivered late is not a default under the contract necessarily. Huh. Okay, and the buyer still has that right to terminate. And, uh, you know, the buyer's agent was actually told, hey, these are going to be late. Is that okay? And the buyer's agent said, okay. Is that, is that the right amount of days that you would recommend no, for, for objection? Yeah, sure. No, the six days. It's, it's in the contract. It's, contract. it's not negotiable. Yeah. It's actually I mean, in the contract that the buyer may cancel within six days and it is not only in the contract but it's also in the statute it's texas law that the buyer has six days so you can't change that one okay. so what That's i've done in the past when because i've run into this exact situation um is i've had an amendment drawn up extending the um, um delivery date for the condo docs and resale Mm -hmm. So you, you you could certainly do that. You could have the document drawn up extending extending the deadline. Helps to manage expectations. When we went through this fun uh, real life scenario, my what I figured out was I'm not sure that it really matters that much aside from managing expectations because the buyer does have this right to terminate that that is not linked to the number of days. So in a lot of our in a lot of the contractual provisions that we deal with, if you have to deliver it within 10 days and then you have a certain number of days afterwards to object, then you're, if, if the delivery wasn't done in time, then, then you're out of luck. But in this case, you're not. So, but again, I love managing expectations. So what was the result on this? Uh, the buyer Buyers. said, well, this just isn't fair and I want you to pay for the sprinkler. Uh, for the sprinklers to be installed, and the seller said, I will see you at closing. And I think that uh, the buyer's broker ended up having to shoulder a good bit of this cost. No, kidding. Yes. 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 Uh, things like that they have to prove of the, the new buyer or they have the right of first refusal or whatever the deal is there's always like it's got to be within 15 days 20 days there's a there's a day yes. there and if and if uh and it says there that the association does not get does not deliver back to the buyer then the, the buyer proceeds without their permission mm -hmm. i mean it's like yeah there are a lot of circumstances where if the association doesn't perform in time then the buyer can can go on but those we have to look at statutes for that i think the agent or broker would be responsible for when the buyer is distributed well because the the agent did not 
impress upon the buyer the importance of reading all of these documents is what the buyer said to the agent. You know, gosh, you didn't tell me that I needed to really review these and this is a complete surprise. And that's how they worked it out, okay? We were not the buyer's broker in that case. I'm just telling you that's how they worked it out. So what about the first right of refusal? Is that anywhere in here? Yes, the first right of refusal is in the condominium document. Yeah. Okay, let's keep. So I don't understand why the seller's agent didn't disclose that. In, 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 because well, why, okay, so why didn't the seller's agent disclose this? In the, beginning? the seller's agent didn't know, and the seller actually had a home, a large home in one of our uh, nice suburban areas in Houston. And this uh, condo was like a weekday flat and uh, they had owned it for several years. And when this change had been made, they simply just weren't paying attention. A lot and so the seller actually just didn't remember, didn't know, wasn't real keyed in, wasn't involved in the association. This is at Four Leaf and a lot of, we sold a lot at Four Leaf and the They're sellers like don't know. They've owned it, like Sita's saying, they've owned it a long time. They didn't know. It was, they bought a unit before it was a requirement to have it sprinkled, and they but owned it. As a listing agent, isn't it your responsibility well, to yeah. contact the HOA to see what the rules and what the so. expectations are? So the question is, as a listing agent, isn't it your responsibility to contact yes. the association and find out what the rules are? Of course. Um, so to answer that question, I would say that um the getting the getting the documents and delivering them to the buyers that's why this is so important in this case if i were the listing agent and i knew about this requirement and, yeah. and then i would have asked some questions and then i would have you know let the let the buyer's agent know that there was this requirement i, I would have put oh, it absolutely. somewhere yeah. in my documents so that the buyer would have known but our listing agent actually did not have that knowledge, and uh, apparently neither did the seller. Yes? How does this not fall under like a special assessment? Those items are usually... Well, it's not considered a special assessment. It's just not in the special assessment bucket. It is a requirement for new owners. Would it be listed on the resale certificate? <laughs> no, it's not listed on the resale certificate because there's not it's not an assessment it's not money that the association is collecting it's not it was not on the resale certificate but the association is requiring that you spend it's not required to be on the resale certificate so let's keep going <laughs> i know everyone's real very intrigued by this right now but that was the real scenario and that's how it all panned out so uh, let's move on to something even more fun, possibly. Parking space calamity. Okay. So, condominium unit six was owned by an estate. Okay, so that means that the woman who lived there had passed on and her son was the executor. She had lived there for 15 years. The condo unit six was marketed with spaces 36 and 37. Uh, at the, so the buyer had some showings. At the end of one of the showings, uh, the agent had left and the buyer was talking to the building concierge and said, would you show me the parking spaces uh, that are, you know, that, that, that go with this unit? And the concierge showed the buyer where the seller, the, I mean, the, the woman who had passed had, had previously parked, uh, spaces 36 and 37. Uh, so the buyer submitted an offer with these with these parking spaces identified. It was accepted. Um, the um, the condo docks were provided to the buyer within the number of days required. So uh, everything was properly delivered. Uh, the buyer didn't uh, apparently look at them too closely. Uh, the buyer closed and started using the parking spaces with with no issue. Well then. Um, a few months later, a different unit in the condominium uh, building cells, unit 29, 
And that buyer contacts our buyer and says, hey, you're parking in the wrong spaces. Those are my spaces. The new buyer says, no, it's in my contract. Um, but it, as it turns out, our buyer looks at the condo declaration, exhibit B to the condo declaration, which has, which has a list of which parking spaces are assigned to which unit and learns, in fact, that the parking spaces assigned to Unit 6 are 11 and 12. So regardless of what the contract said, and regardless of what the contract was attempting to convey, those parking spaces were not the ones assigned by the Condo Owners Association. So um, it turns out that the, uh, the, the, the woman who used to live there uh, and the seller of uh, the, 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 the prior owner of Unit 29 had a verbal agreement 15 years ago when she first moved in that they would exchange their spots, but it was never recorded with the owner's association. Nothing was ever changed. They just used each other's spots and everything just went along just fine and that worked out perfectly. So, um, of course, the buyer calls the agent. You misrepresented my parking spaces on the contract. You told me that I had spaces 36 and 37, and that was wrong. You made a misrepresentation, and I never would have bought this unit if I had known that I had to go walk that far to those parking spaces. Now, whether that's true or not, we don't know. Uh, but um, so in this case, the parties went to the condo association. Everyone went to the everyone went to the condo association and said, "What can we do? Can't we change this based on the fact that this agreement was made by by these parties years ago?" Well, no. The condo association said, "Absolutely not. You know, we the, we have to go with what is actually assigned." Um, so. Um, the buyer was very upset about this, and this is something that we, we don't know how the story ends because there's a statute of limitations involved. So basically, how long does the buyer have to file a lawsuit for misrepresentation against the agent? Seven, yes. Seven years. <laughs> but the resale uh, certificate is signed by the manager of the association, mm -hmm. and he, when you submit the contract, they uh, fill out, you know, whether there's any back HOA fees and which parking spots and mailboxes are assigned to this unit. So it seems to me like they were culpable also. Mm -hmm. Does it have the yes, parking it does. space? Yes, yes, it does. It does. Not always. I, I'm not seeing it here on the resale. On, no. I'm not seeing I'm not, it. I'm not, I'm not, when they fill out the budget, you submit to them and they do fill it out and it does say parking space and mailbox. On the budget? On their. Uh, Okay, well, so so maybe you're talking about a condo association that doesn't use this right. form of a resale certificate. They have their own, and so they provide one that maybe identifies the parking spots. But this is the this is the trek form. Maybe we should make our own. This is the TAR form. Well, we've been told not to make our own okay. forms anymore. Yes, Walter. <laughs> Space, uh, parking spaces, parking space was not conveyed. They, they are reassigned. Oh, they're reassigned. There might be somebody waiting on a list or something. Right. So well, our building does service. convey, but they don't put it on the contract or, or the, the resale, resale certificate. So okay. They should, but they don't. Yeah. They, but it's all right. Dated. So let's keep going, then we'll get to the moral of the story. All right. <laughs> of the stories, multiple stories. All right, Plumbing Van Bard. So this involves, a, this one involves a homeowners association, not a condo. So a buyer, uh, buyers, you know, purchased a home. Uh, they received the subdivision information, which includes all the restrictions, the HOA rules and regulations, and of course the resale certificate. Uh, and they, you know, went on and, and purchased. They, they did not terminate. Um, after receiving those documents. Now the buyers owned a plumbing company and they one of their vehicles was a van that had the name and contact information for the plumbing company on the side of the van. 
So they got a letter from the Homeowners Association saying you are in violation of the HOA rules because our rules prohibit the parking of a commercial vehicle either on the street in front of your house or in your driveway. So the buyer was very upset, contacted the agent, of course, and, you know, had a moment uh, like they tend to do. And um, uh, so was was unhappy, but there was really not much we could do. And this story actually has a happy ending. Does any Is anyone here familiar with Marie Kondo? Yes. Marie Kondo, okay. So, uh, so the buyer ended up changing their garage from a, basically a junk room into a nicely organized garage with space for a van. And so uh, it has a happy ending because the garage then sparked joy. And if y'all don't know Marie Kondo, then you need to. Oh, sparked joy. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. All right. So let's move on. All right. So what lessons can be learned here? So if you are a buyer's agent, my page here. Uh, please make sure that the docs are delivered to the buyer and send the buyer an email saying, hey, you just got these documents. Please make sure you read them carefully. I know they're long, but please be sure to read them. They have important information about your association. Uh, and, you know, keep that email in your permanent file. Hold on to it. Yes. That's a good idea. You have up until the sixth day to terminate after receipt of those documents. Very good idea, Victoria. Thank you. On the, for, on the right of refusal, can we execute the contract until we receive, or do we have to wait till we receive the right of refusal, either reject it or? No, you sign the contract and then execute it. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, and, you know, I know that a lot of agents don't like to read all these documents, but I I, I really encourage y'all to look at them and, and to and to figure out about the parking spaces and to make sure that the ones on the contract are actually the ones that are assigned or figure out what the status is if there if there's about to be a reassignment of parking spaces like y'all talked about in one of these buildings, then figure it out and, and let the buyer know and just and just make sure. And I'm telling you this because we just had a lot of uh, you know, we've had a lot of very upset people uh, upset about parking spaces, so please just check on it. You can also ask the title company to reference the recorded doc that has the parking spaces or storage spaces and have them add that to the legal description so that that way the parking spaces are tied to the unit and they're in the legal description. Okay, well, he's saying he's saying uh, make sure that the parking spaces are in the legal description. And I understand you work for a title company, so you probably know a lot more about this than I do. Uh, but oh. <clears throat> I, from from reading uh, all of the declarations and restrictions and things that that I read, <laughs> my understanding is that sometimes those are not actually an, a, a owned by the unit. Right. Right. But they are just, uh, they are a, a limited common element that is owned by the HOA. And so sometimes the HOA may not want them to be in a deed. Right, but you can ask. Yes, sure, absolutely. Uh, so if you're, if you're a listing agent and you are marketing certain parking spaces, then please do some research and just find out call the HOA, get, somehow get it in writing, look at the declaration, ask them to send you the list showing the assigned parking spaces. So don't so rely on the concierge <coughs> who walks you right to the spot? I wouldn't rely on the concierge who walks you right to the spots. And, you know, I, I, I wouldn't even rely on the sellers sometimes. I mean, let's just, let's make sure because things happen, trades. We've I've learned all sorts of things recently, okay? I mean, there are trades made, there are, you know, documents that are written that are not really appropriate. And there's all kinds of crazy stuff that goes on in this world, especially with regard to condo parking spots. <laughs> I have one more thing, too. Is yes. The, the one that I placed in December, uh, the, I read through, because I do HOA stuff, uh, 
I read through to make sure, and they they did cover the stucco that they they they're assessing and all that for the stucco, but that they would not cover the roof, mm -hmm. and they had a common roof. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I had to talk that over with the buyer and say, you're aware that in supposedly in 2021 they're going to restucco the outside, and there's already assessed for that, but you are responsible for the roof. And already like yeah. 24 years old. But the stucco building in particular, it's a very good idea to check on, you know, assessments, what repairs the buildings have made, has made, if any, if there are any known defects, <coughs> what kind of insurance they have, who's responsible for, uh, you know, repairing stucco, do they have certain, do they have sufficient reserves, uh, all sorts of, there's, there's all sorts of great information in the resale certificates, whether it's the condo resale certificate or the HOA resale certificate, the, well, it's called subdivision information, including resale certificate. But there is great information. And actually, if you read these, they, they sort of track one another. So it's all very similar information uh, about, you know, any unpaid assessments, any special assessments coming due, whether there are any lawsuits, um, whether there are any current violations that the HOA is aware of, whether there are any transfer fees, things of that nature. And then don't forget about all the additional information that is supposed to be provided, such as the current operating budget and the insurance certificate. It's important to know how much insurance these, these buildings are carrying because in some cases there have been some that have not carried sufficient insurance. And then they have to go to their owners and collect special assessments to cover for things that have been done. Uh, a right of refusal is also a big thing. You know, Robert Durst uh, lived in a condominium building uh, over on Robin Hood, and uh, that led to, to you know, uh, all sorts of evaluations. Evaluations, yes. When people were uh, looking at potentially buying the, the the unit that was on the same floor where he lived, the same building. Uh, some people thought twice about that. Some didn't. We sold one, and then we had two buyers go, no, 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 no. Yeah, and then you had a, a, a very loud bar that was oh, down okay. right next to that building. Yes. And then you have somebody extremely back loud, the and then you had uh, a lot, of, lot of stuff going on. You had some stuff going on. Things. I'm sure it's all been resolved now, but I'm just saying it's important to look into all this. So, so just to wrap it up, uh, looking at the differences between a condo owners association versus just a regular owners association. Um, so the condo association docs are contained within the contract. And the, there's a separate addendum for an owner's association. Um, condo owner buyer has six days to terminate after getting the docs. For a regular HOA, it is three days. Six days versus three days. Uh, and this is another question that we often get. So the condo resale certificate is good for three months. So sometimes sellers will ask, well, gosh, should I get it in advance? Well, if you expect to sell within three months, yes, or, you know, depending on the cost, maybe it's a good thing to have ready to go. Um, an owner's association, it doesn't have a, an expiration date, but kind of a general rule of thumb is that you want to have, a, a 30, let's just think about it as 30 days because basically um, assessments could be due every month potentially. And so, you know, there are things that the unit owner could be in arrears in that would show up on a monthly basis. So, um, but often what will happen is that uh, you get a resale certificate and then the title company will order an update to the resale certificate just before closing so that they know that if anything has changed. And also don't forget that the seller actually has a duty to notify the buyer if they have provided a resale certificate and things have materially changed. So if they learn, go to a meeting and learn about a special assessment right after they have delivered a, a resale certificate that doesn't disclose it, then they need to go back to the buyer and say, hey, I just went to this meeting and there is actually going to be a special assessment coming up. So any, any follow-up questions on this? Thank y'all for all, all of your participation during the presentation. Thank and everyone have a great week. Thanks. Y'all don't forget what's next week. Uh, the breakfast. 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 The breakfast. And what time do the doors open? 
7 a.m. No, we start at 7.30. So you come get a cup of coffee at 7 a.m. 7 a.m. 7 a.m. Several cups of coffee. Y'all have a great day, a great week. Thank you. Yeah, well, it's going to be a permanent situation. No, we just got to this. Well, maybe we'll go some ways to get it.